Hey everybody, so today I wanted to talk about a radiation detecting device that I recently made. I got interested in ionizing radiation a few years ago when I picked up this Civil Defense V700 Geiger counter. I got this at a yard sale without even really knowing what it was. I think I paid around $15 for it. And it's actually a really fun toy to play around with. Uh, it had a very serious function at the time it was made. Uh, a lot of people were expecting that a nuclear war might break out at any moment. This actually came along with another type of radiation detector. I believe it was the CDV-715. This one was mainly for training it is a Geiger tube and so it can detect pretty low levels of radiation but in an actual nuclear war the levels of radiation you'd encounter would uh, totally saturate this detector and it would probably be pretty worthless but it's great for training and emergency response activities uh, it has a little check source on the side a little piece of radioactive material that gives off some beta radiation. I've got a little PZO electric element from a greeting card. I've just kind of got taped on here and it actually lets you hear the clicks. Let's see. There you can go. You can hear those clicks and uh, I recently upgraded. I found this at a surplus auction. It's a Ludlum Model 3. It's also a a Geiger probe. This one has what's called a pancake Geiger probe and it's a little bit more sensitive. It has a larger area and also it has a thin window that lets alpha radiation through whereas this one the window only allows beta radiation through and when it's closed pretty much only gamma radiation can get through so you can see this check source gives off beta radiation because with the window closed, it can't detect it. But when I open up the window, it can once again detect it. The, uh, the Ludlum has a nice audio alarm built in it, so I don't need to use a piezoelectric element tape to it. Um, I found a lot of low-level radioactive things around my home. One of the the coolest things is if you take apart an old smoke detector, which I don't necessarily recommend doing it, um, but it has a piece of uh, metal in it with some americesium, which is radioactive. You can hear uh, the americesium drives this detector crazy because it puts out alpha radiation and some low-energy gamma radiation. So. This can detect both of those really easily. And as I kept reading about radiation detec detection, I kept uh, coming across people that were making scintillation detectors. And a scintillation detector works in a slightly different manner than the Geiger tubes work. So inside of here is a piece of plastic that when it gets hit by a gamma ray, it gives off a flash of light. And I have a very sensitive light detector called a photomultiplier tube that amplifies those pulses of light and sends them out of this BNC cable. And you can actually connect this to the Ludlum probe. You need a little BNC adapter for it. I'm going to go ahead and connect that up here. And when I cut it on, you can immediately hear that it is clicking at a much higher rate than the Geiger tube was. And because it picks up so much more radiation per second, it's a lot more sensitive for detecting small levels of radiation. So the number of clicks you measure determines the accuracy of your radiation measurement. So with a Geiger tube, if you want to detect a very small change in radiation levels, you have to average over a long period of time so that you can get enough pulses built up. Whereas with this, normally within just a few seconds, um, you can get enough pulses to get an accurate 
radiation measurement and see very small changes in radiation levels. The next thing I did was I built this control box for it. So I can go ahead and power this up. It has a BNC connector. This is a high voltage switch and this powers it up. And inside of here is a Raspberry Pi with a touch screen I got from Adafruit. Also a battery pack and a battery charger that lets you charge it with a micro USB port. Um, the, the red board is a high voltage board that makes a high voltage that the probe needs. And the green board, it is a uh, amplifier and detector that, that amplifies the pulses. These boards came from RH Electronics and most of the other things came from Adafruit. So you can see it's booted up. So when I open up my little Python application, it starts telling me how many counts per second it has measured and when the GPS gets a signal it'll start showing the time and the latitude and longitude as well. You can see right now in the basement it's a little bit elevated uh, normally I think it's around 20 or 30 counts uh, per second that I pick up but down here I'm getting 50 or, or 60 or so um, as opposed to these Geiger tubes which I believe the pancake Geiger probe, the more sensitive one, gets around 60 counts per, per minute, so around one a second. So this is somewhere around 20 or 30 times more sensitive, meaning that you only have to stay in one place one twentieth or one thirtieth of the time to make the same accuracy of a measurement. So the Raspberry Pi, it logs everything to a CSV file. And I put it all in this directory. Each one of these files is a different time. I started it up. And if you just look at the contents of one of the files, you can see that it just has the time, the latitude and longitude, and then the number of counts it counted in that second. I made a little Python script, you can see it over here, that loads in all of those CSV files and it plots them on a map using a, uh, a library called Smopy or Smopy. It takes a little second to load everything, but once it does, you can see here's a map of Charlottesville and you can see where I've driven and recorded data so this scale goes from around 10 counts per second all the way up to a hundred and there's some interesting features you can see there is one area that stands out up here as having slightly higher than normal counts and this is a local park that I actually drove by on this road and I noticed that right along here the radiation levels were slightly higher so the next day I I purposely went to the park and drove around some and uh, found that they were even higher in the park so here's that same plot of the park with elevated radiation levels and you can see a little bit more detail in this plot. It's interesting. At first I thought perhaps there was just some kind of rock formation around this park that was radioactive. But after plotting this data, I realized it's actually the road itself that's giving off the radiation. So I drove down here and at the very end, there's a little dirt road right here. And as soon as I got on that dirt road, the radiation levels drop back down to normal. Also through here, where they're a little bit lower, is where the surface had been repaved recently. You could see right where the, the paving changes, the radiation levels drop. And any time I walked off of the road, or took this shortcut off the road here, the radiations were, lo were lower. So I think that the gravel that was used probably in the asphalt 
has elevated radiation levels. And over here is a, uh, a dirt road. This, the dirt road starts around here, or, well, a gravel road, I should say. And it's slightly higher than, than the average background as well. So I don't know where they got the gravel for this pavement and for this dirt road, but um, it appears to be, you know, I see some of these counts are around 100 counts per second, whereas normally the background's closer to 20. So, you know, it's four, four or five times higher than what the average background is in the area. So after seeing this data that I had gathered, I continued doing some online research, just looking at um, similar things people had done. And I pretty quickly came across these gamma ray surveys that the uh, United States government conducted from the air. So they had an airplane just fly a course back and forth and they have a whole map of the United States and the colors indicate the background gamma radiation levels. And it's a pretty coarse map. I think the plane, you know, it. I think it was about 10 kilometers between each row. So it it doesn't have a lot of detail. But what I didn't realize is I, uh, actually on this page from the Virginia um, Department of Geology and Mineral Resources, there were some links to papers. And one of the papers was from 1955. And it's really interesting. It's uh, just around the time that I guess uranium mining was becoming really popular and everyone was doing it. And uh, so in this paper, this guy just drives around Virginia in his car with a, uh, a scintillation detector and a Geiger counter. And he mentions different places where he found anomalous radiation. Um, and he pretty much says, hey, someone should come back and investigate these places in more um, detail. And then the next paper I found was written quite a bit later in 1982, and it focuses on the area around Charlottesville. And it says that a more detailed airborne survey was carried out. So instead of you know, 10 kilometers between the survey lines, there were closer to like a, a half of a kilometer, so a lot more detailed. And based on that, they found some areas around Charlottesville with significantly higher than the normal background radiation levels. And so um, one of the places they say that's the most interesting is here at number two, and they have a more detailed map of it. It is just a, a field with these spots that are really radioactive. And I realized this is only a couple miles from where I live, so I uh, hopped in my car one day and drove out to the field with my GPS logging scintillator. So when I got to this field, let's just say I was I was pretty surprised. I, I drove by it, and I didn't really pick up much of an elevated background at all. So I turned around and parked where I thought the field was. I wasn't exactly sure I was in the right spot. And I got out of my car and started walking. And as I was walking across the field, the levels were a little bit higher than normal, but not that crazy. Um, until I got down to this one spot where the road turns and um, the levels just were were higher than anything I had seen. So um, right in the center of this, I was getting around 2000 counts per second on the scintillator. And before that, the highest levels I had seen um, were around 100 counts per second. So, uh, you know, 20 times that. And the normal background is somewhere around 20 counts a second. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, somewhere al almost a hundred times more radioactive than, than the average background. So, uh, I, I continued walking and it, it dropped off pretty quickly. And then I turned around and walked back through the field, uh, a couple times. And it was really just, uh, really localized to a small area. And I didn't, uh, spent a lot of time walking back and forth across the field. I pretty much just went down and then straight back, but it, it was pretty surprising to me. Um, I was in a rush, so I didn't 
stay very long. I just kind of walked over it, got back in my ta my car and left. Uh, but then the next day, I actually came back with my Geiger counter as well, and I uh, have a little video that I recorded while I was there. Here at this field, a little bit south of Owensville, you can see, uh, even standing right here, there's a slightly elevated level of background radiation, but uh, the road's just right up that hill, but right in the corner here, the dirt is very hot, very spicy. So I kind of lay my pancake probe down there. Let's see, it's getting about three or four thousand counts per minute um, from this pancake probe. So. I think the background normally is around 60 counts per minute with this probe, so it's pretty high. And my scintillation detector is sitting right over there, and it's picking up. Uh, right now it's at 1,200. I've seen it go over 2,000 in that spot where the pancake probe is right now. So going back to this paper from 1982, I was really interested to try and get my hands on these more detailed aerial radiometric surveys that they mentioned. And so I actually called up the Division of Geology and Mineral Resources and a geologist that worked there told me they had paper copies of these surveys, that they weren't online but he could scan some of them and send them to me. And so he was nice enough to do that. Here is a map showing the uh, the zoomed out region and then these individual maps they have are more detailed so he sent me this big map you can see down here it says it was flown May and June of 1976 and the traverse spacing was a half of a mile so that's pretty detailed they would fly a row and then move up a half a mile and they flew at an altitude of 500 feet here is the more detailed map, one of them he sent me. Uh, you can see this is Interstate 64, here's Charlottesville, and the field where I was walking around in is right here. And you can see that where that field is, there is an elevated level of radiation, 499 counts per second. But it's not actually that much higher than you know, here's a place with 515 counts per minute. So I don't exactly understand how they knew that was worth investigating um, in person. I don't know if it had something to do with the underlying geology that they knew about. But in any case, it would be really interesting to overlay my uh, data with these aerial surveys and kind of see um, how they compare. That's something I plan on working on. Um, next, that's probably the next thing I'm going to try to implement is some way of comparing the two to see if, you know, if areas of high radiation on this map correspond to areas that I've seen. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have to show you all for now. Thanks for watching this video and let me know if you have any questions and I'm going to try to post some more information probably on my blog. And, uh, but yeah, thanks for watching and hope you enjoyed it.